We all, I guess the first question as we begin to dig into the message for this morning is how many of you guys have on your bracelets? Let me see them. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all are looking at me like, what are you talking about? Because you maybe were not here last week. So if you are, are sitting there thinking, what in the world are you talking about with this bracelet? Let me just go ahead and tell you. We started this series last week called My Big Fat Mouth. Anybody have issues with your mouth? Man, don't we all? Those of you that don't have your hands up, you have issues with lying, which I'm preaching about in two weeks. So uh, if you didn't have your hand up, make sure that you're here in two weeks. We all have issues with our mouth. Last week, I preached about complaining. And let me tell you that that is probably my biggest issue. I'm a complainer. I look on the critical side of everything. I, I hate it. I hate it. And so last week when I was preaching to you, I was actually preaching to me. And so I have moved this bracelet and moved this bracelet. I'm sick of this bracelet. Let me ask you this. How many of y'all got sick of the bracelet this week and you just took it off? Uh-huh. You need to get your bracelet back on. Satan is working on your mind, and the Lord is trying to use the bracelet to help you. Listen, uh, so, so last week, the, here's the, 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 the concept of the message, okay? The concept was of, of the message is if you can change your circumstances, stop complaining and change your circumstances. Amen? But there's sometimes that you can't change your circumstances. So if you cannot Change your circumstances. Change your viewpoint of your circumstances. You can change your viewpoint. And we talked about Paul, how he was in prison and how he wrote while he was in prison to the, the church in Philippi. Do not, in everything that you do, do it without complaining. He's in prison. He changed his viewpoint. Change, if you can change your circumstances, change your circumstances. If you cannot, change your viewpoint. So the goal of these bracelets, y'all, it's hard. The goal of the bracelet is uh, to go 21 days without complaining. And here's how it works. You put the bracelet on. When you begin to complain and you realize that you're complaining, you take the bracelet and you switch it over to the other hand. And when you switch it to the over other hand, you start back at day one. And you're trying to go 21 days without moving this bracelet from this hand to this hand. I have come to find out in my life, I think it might be impossible. The studies show that it takes about four to eight months to go 21 days for a normal person without, four to eight months to go 21 days without complaining. But I want to encourage you not to give up because what you're doing, listen to me now, what you're doing is you, you recognizing the fact that you are complaining and that you're having to move your bracelet is, is doing something in your mind. You are retraining your mind. You're thinking about the fact that what you speak is powerful. And you're retraining your mind that instead of complaining, to stop complaining and think about truth and think about God. Hey, just out of curiosity, let's have some fun. How many of you guys right now are on day seven that you have not complained? I was about to call out the liars and there's not any. How many of you guys are on day six? Day five. Oh, sweet. Day four. Okay. Day three. Day two. Day one. Ah! <laughs> I'm actually on day one too, y'all. I was so determined to be on day two so that I could tell y'all I was on day two. And yesterday I got home and my wife was like killing me about the house. I let my son go to this birthday party and he was supposed to do the dishes and he didn't do the dishes. And so when she started complaining to me, it's her fault, you know, when she started complaining to me that he didn't do the dishes, then I turned around and I started complaining to all the kids and then it hit me. Dang it, I'm not going to be able to make it two days before we get to Sunday. So I, my goal this week is on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'm just going to fast from talking. And, uh, and if I fast from talking, there's absolutely no way that I can complain. <laughs> okay, so um, let's jump into this morning. We're in this series called My Big Fat Mouth. And the goal of this series is to help us to understand how powerful our mouth is. Y'all, sometimes we don't understand, but there's power in literally every word that comes out of your mouth. Amen. The Bible says that we speak life and we speak death. There's power in your tongue. Amen? Amen? So if you're taking notes this morning, the title to the message today is Criticizing. Now let me just say, this is number two for me. Complaining is a high up number one. 
Number two is criticizing. So again, I'm going to be stepping. I wore my boots <laughs> because I knew I was going to be stepping all over my toes. Uh, and so I'm not, I'm, I'm learning with you on this topic of criticizing. Here's we go. Here's what criticizing is. Indicate the faults of someone or something in a disapproving way. Ugh. Everybody say that hurts. Listen, as I read that definition, it really made me go back to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 5. Jesus is talking to the hypocrites, to the Jews, and here's what he says to them. Hypocrites, first get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Oh, man. That's tough stuff. Sometimes, sometimes we're just a people that criticizes, and we criticize everything, especially religious people. Amen? We don't see it the way that we want it to see and we want it to go and we just criticize everything. Sometimes we criticize to be funny. For example, I, uh, I have been made fun of literally my entire life on the way that I shoot a basketball. It's, y'all, it hurts. It ain't funny. It's funny to everybody else, but it ain't funny. And so I, I, I don't, I, I learned, I started basketball in sixth grade and I, I, if you've ever seen me shoot, shut up. If you've ever seen me shoot, you know that it, it looks kind of funny. I, I, I don't know. I do some kind of thing where it goes back here and, and, uh, and I shoot. And literally since sixth grade, I've always, I never got it right and I've always been made fun of. Uh, it went from sixth grade until the present where now my children make fun of me. Uh, for the way that I shoot basketball because they shoot correctly and I don't. But let me tell you something. If we play one-on-one, -on -one, I don't care how many times I have to foul them, I'm going to win the game. <laughs> I may not can shoot, but, but I'm going to win. And so I've always been made fun of for this, and it hurts, y'all. Another thing that really, 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 it, I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me, but I get made fun of weekly, y'all, by our staff. Literally, weekly. It hurts, y'all, and it makes me mad. They make fun of, they, uh, they say that, that blue jean shorts are not in style. Nope. I don't understand that. You hear that kid? Somebody needs to discipline him. <laughs> Literally, I come to work probably three days a week in blue jean shorts. But they say, blue jean, what are you doing? Wear some khakis. Wear this. Eh, eh, eh. Blue jean shorts, what, you look like you're 50 years old. They tell me that all the time. You look like you're 50 years old. Get some. Blue jean shorts cannot go out of style. They can't. Listen, that, that's the stupidest argument I ever heard in my life. Do blue jeans go out of style? No. no. Why? Now they change. We went, you got Wrangler blue jeans. They had Jinkos and Pacos that was like this big. You can have all kind of blue jeans, but blue jeans don't go out of style. Listen to me now. Blue jean shorts are just sh shorts for people that wear blue jeans when it's hot. And I get criticized every week when I come in. Somebody needs to do some rebuking on our staff, y'all. <laughs> Another thing that really hurts, and this one's getting down no longer funny anymore. It hurts, y'all. And one of the things that I get criticized about and it hurts is when somebody comes up to me and they tell me that they're thinking about going to a different church or that um, they're moving to a different church because I, I don't preach meat enough. And... Um, and they tell me that. I've, I've heard that at least 15 times in the past four years of being the pastor, uh, the lead pastor here at Claus. Well, we're going to a different church because yeah, we, you, we love you, pastor, but you just, you don't preach meat enough. Okay. Do you want me to give you a, what that means? Here's what they're saying when you say that. You're saying, I don't agree with what you're preaching. You're saying, when you say, I, you don't preach meat enough. What you're saying is, what you're preaching is not reaching my level of expectations of what I think you should preach. And when that gets said to me as a pastor, for you it's probably something else, but as a pastor, when that gets said to me, it cuts. It hurts. Even though I know that what I'm preaching is exactly what God wants me to preach. I know that what I'm preaching is my big fat mouth because God wants to deal with our mouths. I know that what I'm bringing to you is exactly what, it still hurts when people say those kind of things. Amen? For you, it's probably different. 
So today I'm talking about criticism. I'm not talking about what we sometimes call constructive criticism, where we want to speak into someone's life and we want to help them. I'm talking about criticizing that hurts and tears down and condemns and discourages and destroys lives. And can I just be honest with you? I believe with all my heart that the church probably has a bigger problem with criticism than any other organization. Here's what happens so many times in the church. We look around and we see somebody, they're not preaching so it's not their expectation of preaching. But we somebody li- see somebody living in a way that doesn't meet the expectation of what we think they should live. And instead of going to them and helping them to move forward and mature in their walk with God, instead of going and, and, and walking a, a, along them in their life and, and helping them to move forward, what we do is we speak these critical things. We have these negative things that we allow to come out of our mouth. And instead of lifting them up, we rip them to pieces. Amen. And when we rip them to pieces, it doesn't help anyone mature. It doesn't help you mature. It helps you to be immature. When I say you, I mean me too. And it doesn't help them mature. No, it makes them want to run away from Jesus Christ because you're giving them a picture of Jesus Christ that he is really not. Somebody say, preach it. Preach it. There's so much power, y'all, in our words. Dale Carnegie said this, any fool can criticize and complain and condemn, and most of them do. Amen? But it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. There's a scripture that goes hand in hand with that, y'all. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18. It says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. I want you to stop right now. I want you to think about how much power is in that. Every day. Everyday life, there's so much power in what you say every single day. You have the the choice to bring healing through your words, encouragement through your words, or you have the, 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 the power to cut deep with your words. Has anyone ever been having like a really horrible day, really bad day, and then all of a sudden in the midst of that really horrible day, somebody speaks life like some beautiful words into your life. And it goes from being like this really, really, really bad day to boom, you're like on cloud nine. Anybody ever heard that happen? Happened to me not too long ago. I was going through some things uh, here at the church, dealing with some hard situations, wasn't sleeping very much. You know, when I get there, I'm like questioning, Lord, is there somebody better than me to be doing this? Do you want to put somebody else here? You know, I do all that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, as I'm going through all of this in my mental state, because all of us deal with our mental state, I'm going through this in my mental state, I get a text message, and I look at this text message, and I begin to read it, and it's someone that got saved here just six or seven months ago, and he just texts me to say, I just want to thank you for being my pastor since I I've been coming to Clawson. Here's the things that God's been doing in my life. And he's been doing all of these things. And he's restored these things. And I went from having a bad day to like tears in my eyes. And God going, yeah, I got you where I want you. Amen. Why? Because somebody spoke <laughs> life. There is power in the words that you allow to come out of your mouth. Anyone ever been having a really good day? You're having this fantastic day. You're walking on cloud nine. And then all of a sudden, boom, somebody speaks death to you. Somebody comes and they criticize and they tell you that they talk crap about your shorts. Yeah. Or they, you know, you, you put it in play for you. What does that look like for you? You're having this great day and maybe they criticize your work and you take a lot of pride in your work and they criticize your work and then it makes you go back and think about all of your work or they, they say something and when they say something, it's not encouraging, it's not constructive criticism, it's tearing you down. And you went from having this fantastic day to now you're like, you just want to go home and go to bed. Anybody ever been there? I've been there. Why? Because there's power in the words that we speak. And church, I'm here to tell you that if you're walking through life with a negative, critical attitude and spirit, it's not enough to just try to change your habits because it's much, much deeper than that. Much, much deeper than that. We speak when we speak. Do your words heal or do they pierce? 
Are you an encourager or are you a criticizer? Here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. He says, let everything that you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Let everything that you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement. What are your words? What words do you allow to come out of your mouth? Do you rip people up and tear people down and you don't really view it as that big of a deal? Or do you speak life into people? So the, the title to the second piece of what I want to talk to you about is becoming an encourager. The way to stop being a criticizer is to become an encourager. Becoming an encourager. Number one is this. Criticism is a heart issue, not a habit issue. Criticism is a heart issue, not a habit issue. When our minds think critically, and we spend so much time criticizing and tearing down, it goes much deeper than just a habit that we have. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It is a heart issue. And Jesus, uh, the, the scripture that I gave you just a minute ago, Jesus was talking to the Jewish people that had a heart issue. And I want to tell you what he says. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. We're going to read this whole piece. He says, and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? So many times we got the log, we got no idea the log's there. Why? Because you're just used to it. How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First, get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will be able to see enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Listen, in these scriptures, Jesus is speaking about critical people. People that are tearing down. People that look at everyone else as doing everything wrong, and they are just doing it right so they can tell everybody else how to do it. That's who he's talking about. Some of you know some of those people. Some of us may be some of those people. And this is what... A lot of times we say things like, well, I'm just speaking the truth. Well, that's just how I am. I'm brutally honest. I say that a lot. <laughs> well, I'm just being observant. I'm just trying to help them improve. And Jesus tells us here, this is not an issue of habit. This is an issue of your heart. It's a heart issue. It goes so much deeper than just trying to change your habit. If you're walking through life and you're critically cutting down people, you don't need to try to change your habits. You need to work on your heart. Because when you work on your heart, your habits will change. What you speak will change. What, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You ever heard somebody say, well, man, that person's just got a critical spirit? You don't hear anybody say they got a critical habit? Why? Because it is a spiritual thing that they're dealing with. And it is a spiritual fix that's going to take to fix it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Psalms 51 and 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Here's the step number one. Step number one in becoming an encourager is looking within yourself to see if you have a critical spirit and beginning to deal with it. David says, they're creating me a clean heart, oh God. So the first thing that I want to encourage you to do today is to ask the Lord, Lord, am I speaking life or am I speaking death? Show me. Show me the words in my mouth. When I speak, reveal to me. Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. Create in me a clean heart. So we're talking about becoming an encourager. Point one, criticism is a heart issue, not a habit issue. Number two in your notes is this. This one's hard, y'all. Encouragers don't avoid the truth. Write this down. Being an encourager doesn't mean you never have to say tough things. It means that everything that you say is in love and gentleness. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly Help that person right back on the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Now let's stop and talk about this for just a minute. I don't want you to get confused. Because I think so many times we think 
Well, if I'm going to be an encourager and if I'm going to speak life, I'm just not going to deal with that situation. I'm, just, I'm not going to go confront my friend on the sin that they're having. I'm not going to go and, uh, and, and, and talk about this person with this deep issue. Um, and encouragers don't avoid the truth. The fact is you are not being encouraging and you are not helping them if you're not helping them deal with those things. Amen? Amen. And so you help people to deal with those things, but the way that you go about doing it is the important piece. How? Listen, it's important for us to stand, y'all. It's important for us to stand for our faith, to stand for what's right. But how you stand for something is what this scripture is dealing with. He says those who are godly should gently and humbly go and help that person back on the right path. Stand up for what's right. Have difficult conversations. But do it in the right way. Because how you have that conversation is most likely going to be the difference between life and death in their life. Amen? Amen? I think sometimes we get this idea that to be an encourager, we just have to agree with everyone that everyone says. Everything that everyone says. Never stand up for what we believe. But to be a true encourager is to always show the love of Christ. So what does that look like? Let me ask you a question. If I know that somebody is addicted to methamphetamines and they come to me and they want $100, am I showing them love by giving them $100? No, what am I doing? I am enabling them to get something that I don't believe that they should have. Well, you just don't show the love of Jesus. No, I'm showing your love by not giving you $100 and saying, I'll go buy you a cheeseburger. Let's come back to the church and let's start dealing with the issues that you have. Amen? What about over here with this situation that we have going over here? When I decide to let my kids run crazy and not discipline them or deal with their issues because I want to be my kid's friend or I want them to love me or I don't want them to be mad at me or I don't want to have that conversation. Am I showing my kids love? No. No. The Bible talks about those who don't discipline their children hate their, dis- their, their children. That's what the proverb says. So when I discipline my kids, it's hard, y'all. Those conversations are hard. Amen? But I don't avoid the truth ever. I, I discipline my kids because I love my kids. If my brother or sister in Christ is struggling bad and drowning in sin, should I just say, is it showing love to just say God will deal with it? No, I do everything that I can to help them come out of that. Even if it's the 475th time, I love them. I keep, I don't enable them. I let them get the discipline they need for the decisions that they've made. But I help them to move forward in their walk with Jesus Christ. That is how I love them. Man, y'all are quiet. Can I just say as a pastor, most of my job is dealing with hard conversations. I hate them. They're hard. I've had lots of hard conversations with lots of you guys in this room. Some of you are still with me. Some of them were not. What does that look like? What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, listen, one of my favorite things is to watch God transform people. And in, in, in the last 10 months... We've had multiple people that I've watched a move of God on their life. And I've watched God moving and doing things and them get saved and are, are you know, coming and, and allowing God to stir up new things inside of them. And then they want to get baptized. Of course, I want them to get baptized. Or they want to become a member. And then I learn something about their life. What do you learn? I, I learned that there's open sin. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean that God is moving on their life on Sunday. You can see it. They're pouring. They're being genuine. But they're falling into temptation every weekend and going out drinking. Or God is moving in their life on Sunday. You can see it. You can can feel the presence of God moving on them. But they're still living in sexual sin with somebody that they should have married a long time ago. And they're like, I want to move forward. I want to help them. Y'all, that's a hard conversation. Why is that a hard conversation? Because I can't baptize somebody that's doing that. We can't allow that person to be a member. 
If we're going to do those things, we have steps that we take. And the next step would be, how can I help you to get out of that sin? The next step would be, how can I help you to get married? The next step would be, how can I help you to get these open things that you have in your life? And then we'll baptize you. And then you can become a member. And then you can move forward. But we got to start right here and deal with this thing first. Y'all, it's quiet. Cause why? Because those are hard conversations to have. But here's the thing. An encourager. And y'all, when I see God working on somebody's life, I want to say, Lord, can I just, can I baptize them now? We'll marry them later. Anybody? No, that's just me. That doesn't have anything to do with your job. Lord, please, can we do this? I always have to stand for what's right. We always have to stand for what's right. Here's what we, we, we justify not having conversations so many times with our kids, not having conversations with our friends, not having conversations with our spouses because they're hard conversations. And to be an encourager, you have to learn how to have and deal with those hard conversations. And the key to that verse is this. Those who are godly should gently and humbly help that person. That's tough, y'all. Because a lot of times when we see somebody down, we think that we're up here and it's real hard to be that humble part. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Gently and humbly help that person. Number three, last one. Encouragers change lives. Encouragers change lives. I want to read you real quickly one of the most incredible stories. Makes me want to be so much like Jesus. If you have your Bible, turn with me to John, John chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 3 through 11. It says, As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the very act of adultery. They put her right in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Wow. Here comes that humbly part. Let the one who has, has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Like he didn't know. Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Everybody say, neither do I. You see, church, in this story, we see the difference between somebody that's critical and somebody that speaks words that cut and somebody that is encouraging and building and lifting. In this story, you have the Pharisees who are the most critical people, literally, that have ever walked the face of the earth. They cut and they cut and they cut and nobody can measure up. Some churches are like that. Amen. And then you have Jesus who doesn't even really have to say anything. Hey, whichever one of you guys hadn't sinned, y'all go ahead and hit her first. Y'all go ahead and throw the first one. Well, this is the law, okay? How many times have you broke the law? How many times have you sinned? How many times have you made a mistake and done something stupid? So you, those of you that are perfect, you throw the stone. And then he stoops back down and then he gets up and says, you mean nobody condemned you? No, 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 they didn't. Well, neither do I. How encouraging. I'm not condemning you either. Go and stop sinning. Go and live your life the way that I've called you to live your life. Go and sin no more. Amen. The Pharisees' words pierced like swords. Jesus' words brought healing. The Pharisees saw a sinful, evil woman, which is so easy to do. And Jesus saw a child of God that was just not living in his will for her life. As I'm getting ready to close this message, I want you to think, which one of these people that you are more like? I want you to think about your words. 
And then I want you to think about which one of these people that you want to be more like. It's so easy, y'all, when you look around to want to tear everybody else up. Sinners! And I'm not even talking about in the church. I'm talking about in the world. I'm talking about everywhere. It's so easy to want to do that. But what God's called us to do is walk alongside of people, encourage them, and speak words of hope and words of healing in their life. Would you stand with me? I want to end this message with a thought. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Here's the thought. What if one word of encouragement from you brings life to someone who's only heard death in their life? Think about this. What if one word of encouragement from you is literally the word of encouragement that someone receives that takes them from not following Jesus to following Jesus and now they have an eternity in heaven? What if one word of encouragement from you takes a pistol out of somebody's mouth and they're in this horrible, horrible place in their life and they receive a word of encouragement from you that literally saves their life. Listen, church, what comes out of your mouth is so important. What comes out of my mouth is so important. What if one word of encouragement from you has the power to save and change lives? What if I could use my big fat mouth to give life instead of death? The truth is I can, but it's up to me and how I use it. Every head bowed and every eye closed. As you're standing, I'd like to invite our worship team to come and our altar team to come and step out and get up here at the front. And as you're standing, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and guide you today? First of all, if you're here, if you're here and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, listen to me. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, what does that even mean? I have a personal relationship if you are not walking your life out with Jesus by your side, if you haven't made him the Lord of your life, maybe, maybe you did years ago and you walked away. Maybe life happened and you made some stupid decisions and you found yourself on a path that was not of Jesus and you haven't came back to the path that you need to. Or maybe you're here and you're searching and that path is the path that you want to take, but you've Never had the opportunity to do that. If you're here today in just a second when we start singing this song, if you need to give your life to Christ, I want to invite you. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says that Jesus came and he took on our sin. He died so that we could be saved. Secondly, if you're in here today and you know that you need to work on your mouth, I want to give you the opportunity either, number one, to get prayer for your mouth and allow God to do some spiritual things in your mouth. Remember I told you that it's not a habit issue, it's a spiritual issue. A critical spirit is a spiritual issue that you need to deal with. And if you're here and you need to work on that spiritual issue, whether that's by yourself with God or whether that's allowing somebody else to pray for you in just a second when we begin to sing, I want to invite you to do that. And lastly, if you're here and you need prayer for anything else, maybe your marriage is on the rocks and it's struggling, maybe you need healing, Whatever that looks like for you, if you need prayer, if the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you, if God's pushing you, do not leave without getting what God wants to do in you today. Let's sing this song. Come on, right now, as we begin to sing this song, if you need prayer, step out and come right now.